I kind of come from the web standards and accessibility space. I currently work at Microsoft. I work on the Edge browser, but I work in developer relations. Um, and mainly what I get to do is stuff like this, come and talk to people about best practices. Um, and today I want to talk a bit about PWAs, because I think this is, this is something that's been buzzing around for, for quite a long time, um, or at least the last couple of years. And I want to start by defining what exactly a PWA is. In case you're unfamiliar with that term, if that's a wholly new thing to you, a PWA is a progressive web app. Um, and if you struggle to define what exactly a progressive web app is in your head, don't worry, you are not alone. There have been bunches and bunches of articles by very smart people who are trying very hard to define what exactly uh, makes something a progressive web app. Uh, when it comes down to it, the term progressive web app is a marketing term, very much along the lines of those of you who, are, who have some, some gray like I do, remember DHTML, um, or if you remember HTML5, which for some reason included CSS3 and like cutting edge JavaScript APIs, like whatever that was about, marketing terms, right? PWA is something that people can rally behind and it's something your, your boss may ask you for or the marketing team may ask you for or, or something like that. Um, and it's something that, that we can all, can all kind of talk about, but we're all gonna end up with slightly different versions of what exactly a PWA is. Um, I think a lot of people get tripped up when they see progressive web app because of these last two words, web app. Um, the reality is that any website, any sort of web project can really benefit from being a progressive web app in various ways. Not all sites need push notifications. Not all sites really can work offline in a, in a perfect one-to-one -one sense as they can online, um, but they can all benefit from performance improvements and other things that PWAs enable us to have. Um, so in many ways, you could probably think of these as being just progressive websites. Okay, so it's basically any, any web property, any, any web project can benefit from becoming a progressive web app. Um, so who is behind PWAs? Probably most of you who are familiar with them probably learned about them from somebody at Google because that's where the initial spec for Service Worker, which I'll talk about in a little bit, came from. Um, but at this point in time, every modern browser supports uh, the, the basic foundations of progressive web apps. Um, the only e exception at this point, and this may be fixed by now, I don't know because I don't have an iOS device, but there were some limitations around push on iOS. I don't think Apple has implemented it yet, but, um, but they may have by this point, or if you're watching at home. Um, now, as somebody who builds websites, we, we want technical definitions, right? Like we want to know what exactly do I need to do in order to build something that is considered a progressive web app. Well, there are three key components that are really prerequisites to having a progressive web app. Um, and the first of those is having a secure site. You must be running under HTTPS. Now, this is generally a good idea. Um, there are some complications to HTTPS, which I'm not gonna get into, but um, it's generally a good idea. HTTPS is very easy to implement nowadays as opposed to uh, back in the early days of the web when you had to jump through all sorts of hoops to get a certificate. Um, but there are a lot of really useful JavaScript-based APIs that are gated by HTTPS, and Service Worker is one of those that I'll, I'll be talking about momentarily. Um, things like geolocation, that has moved behind HTTPS now. A lot of the things that are gonna deal with people's sensitive information, those are gonna require that you be on a secure connection with your users. So that's why HTTPS is the first uh, thing that you need to do. The second component is what's called a web app manifest. Um, and essentially a web app manifest is a JSON file. Um, and it includes a bunch of metadata about your site or about your application or about your game or whatever it is that you're building. Uh, this is just an excerpt from the Washington Post uh, web app manifest, uh, at least at the time that I grabbed it. It includes things like the name, the short name that you wanna use if there's not a whole lot of room on like a home screen, for instance. Um, you can have a whole set of different icons that could be used in varying contexts. You have a start URL, what sort of display mode you want. 
and that defines how much browser Chrome is around it if it's installed. Um, I'm not gonna get into the particulars of how you can, can dive into the, the manifest because it's not really relevant to discussing media uh, in particular, uh, apart from the icons. And then the third piece is the service worker. And I'm actually gonna ask you to hold off thinking about service worker for a moment. I'm gonna circle back to it because I wanna talk about sort of the, the promise and the benefits of, of progressive web apps uh, before. So there is a lot of hype. There are a ton of uh, articles that tout how awesome PWAs are gonna be and how you know, native programming is gonna go away. I don't think native as a, as a platform, as you know, a, a way that we build applications is going to go away. But I do think that progressive web apps and the web in general um, has become very powerful such that you know, if you want to build something and you're trying to build a, a piece of software that has parity on a bunch of different platforms, including the web, it may make the most sense for you to build that as a web app and then use uh, the capabilities of progressive web apps to be able to install that on different uh, platforms, whether that's mobile or whether that's desktop. Um, so I think there's some really compelling uh, case studies out there, a lot of them coming out of uh, Google because they've been doing a lot of work with partners on building out these case studies. And I'm gonna walk through just a couple of those. Um, Carnival Cruise Lines, they saw that there was a, a greater opt-in rate and a larger op open rate for push notifications using their PWA um, over their, their mobile website. Starbucks saw a two-time increase in daily active users for people on their PWA. And if any of you are Starbucks users um, and you actually go to the website and sign in, at that point you're in the PWA, whether you've installed it or not, um, which is kind of cool. And actually there was another stat that they shared with us. Um, this is a, a year out of date at this point, but I wanna say it was something like 40% of their order aheads were actually coming from their PWA on desktop, um, which is kind of surprising because desktop PWAs weren't something that people were really talking about at the time. Uh, although that has since become something that's possible. Tinder was actually able to drop their core experience size by 90%. So they went from having a 30 meg app to a 2.8 meg app. That is substantial. Trivago saw a 97% increase in clickouts to, to hotel offers in their PWA, and West Elm also saw increases in time on site and increased revenue um, per visit from their PWA over their mobile site. So there's a lot of great success stories for PWA. There's a ton more if you go to pwastats.com, if this is the sort of thing that you wanna you know, have some conversations with your, your biz dev folks or, uh, or with your management. Uh, PWA Stats has a lot of really great ammunition for, for having discussions around why PWA might be a good choice for you. So back to the, the pillars, I wanna tuck into Service Worker now because this really is sort of the linchpin of progressive web apps and is, is part of what makes them so incredible. So first of all, a service worker is a kind of web worker. Um, and, and a web worker, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a, a JavaScript concept that allows a certain script to run in its own thread. And it can communicate back and forth with the main thread that your, your website's working on. Um, and the whole idea behind service worker is to reduce network dependence. And I like to kind of think of it, of it as my own personal man in the middle uh, because it allows me to uh, intercept and manipulate web traffic. You can't actually, like, if, if you're communicating via HTTPS, you can't actually, like, adjust the markup that's coming through. Um, but you can do all sorts of other things, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so a, uh, a service worker is something that you need to register in your page. And you do that using the, uh, the code that you see up here. So the first thing that you will do is you actually check to see, is Service Worker supported by this browser? Because we always want to be testing for APIs that we want to take advantage of. So once we know that Service Worker is actually supported, we can say, OK, navigator.serviceworker.register. And then I supply the path to the Service Worker JavaScript file. So this exists not in your main JavaScript. It has to exist in its own isolated file. And the path is incredibly important. The way that Service Worker is spec'd, it can only affect its directory that it sits in and below. So if you were to have this JavaScript file inside of a JavaScript subfolder or a JS subfolder or a J subfolder, it would only be able to affect network requests within that folder. 
So this is something that you want to have in, in the root of your site if that's where you want it to operate. So that can take a little, that, that can trip you up. So the service worker has what's called a life cycle uh, of, of different events that take place. There's a lot of nuance to it. Um, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. I'm going to kind of give you the Cliff's Notes version. Um, but the first thing that happens is we register our service worker with the browser. So the browser becomes aware that there's this service worker, right? Then it kicks off the install process. And this is actually an opportunity for you as a developer to say, hey, while you're installing the service worker, go ahead and pre-cache some assets. Maybe your, your main CSS file, your main JavaScript file and stuff like that, that you want to be there uh, as, as soon as possible. Once the service worker is installed, it's activated. You have another event that you can do things with. Like This is a, a place where people typically will put code to remove old caches. And I'll talk about the cache stuff in a minute. Uh, but you might want to purge old caches because you have a new service worker in play. Uh, so this would be a time that you might want to do that. And then the service worker doesn't do anything until the browser is reloaded. So it can't do anything until you're actually on the second page uh, in the navigation scheme. Um, and at that point, the service worker is ready, and the service worker can begin to intercept network requests. So in um, the sort of pre-service worker days, what happens is your browser makes a request to the internet for a given asset, and then the internet returns it, hopefully. Um, and so that's kind of the, the way that we've tra traditionally been used to our websites working. Now, when Service Worker comes along, it actually changes that. Uh, first of all, it has access to a cache. And this is where it can tuck its own files. So for instance, let's say you've pre-cached your CSS and your JavaScript. When the browser actually requests that, the Service Worker can say, oh, you know what? I've got that in the cache. I'm going to go look over there. Oh, I got it back. And I'm going to spit it back to the browser. I am never going to touch the network at all. So this is how it builds up network resilience, which is pretty awesome. So let's say, for instance, you're requesting an asset that isn't in the cache. So the, the browser comes along. It says, hey, I want this resource. The service worker says, hey, I'm going to look in the cache. Up, oh, cache couldn't find it. All right, no big deal. I'm going to fall back to the web. I'm going to go out to the internet, and I'm going to get that file back. All right, I got the file. And now I'm going to not only deliver it back to the browser, but I'm going to stick it in the cache as well so that I have it for the next time that I come back to the site. Okay. So this is what allows us to create really good offline experiences for our users. Now, it's important to understand uh, the browser cache a little bit because you know, this, this is a really important part of what it is that we're working with. So there are two types of cache within the browser. There is the temporary cache, and that is what the browser purges. So that's the, the cache that we've tra traditionally been used to, where you know, we're using CDNs and stuff like that and sharing the, the link to, to jQuery so that hopefully all of us have the same version and are just referencing that one file and it's already in the browser cache. Um, and then there's this persistent cache which is what the user has to purge. And that's like your cookies, your index DB, um, file system access stuff. Uh, and the application cache will soon be subsumed under there as well. So it'll be a little bit longer lived um, than the temporary browser cache. And now browsers actually have limits on how much you can store in the cache as well. And these vary widely <laughs> based on how much uh, volume size you have. Um, and it's a little bit complicated to kind of wrap your head around, but I'll just walk through a, a few examples here. So if you've got less than eight gigs of storage on, or volume size, then your overall limit is just 50 meg, or, or the overall limit for the browser is 50 megs of memory, okay? And then every domain is only allowed to have 20% of that, or what is that, 10 megs, right? If you have eight to 32, you get 20% of 500 megs or 100 megs and so on and so forth. And then it gets really complicated when you get to larger disk sizes uh, over 32 gigs, where you have 4% of volume up until a 20 gig maximum uh, as the overall limit. And then you get a little 20% share of that. Okay. Um, there is a, a challenge on iOS um, for the, uh, the cache the service worker has access to. Safari on iOS will limit it to 50 megs regardless, currently. So we need to be 
uh, aware of this and be uh, kind of responsible in what it is that we're caching and making sure that we're not uh, overloading that. Now, there is some discussion about whether or not it might make sense for us to raise these limits. Um, that might happen. We may also look at potentially allowing unlimited storage for installed PWAs. So this would be something that would benefit somebody like Hulu, who might in the future want to allow you to download episodes of a show to watch offline. And they do have a PWA, right? So that would be kind of cool. Um, so storage is definitely a priv privilege, and we don't want to abuse it. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we need to make some better choices. First of all, no animated GIFs. They're too big. You know, this has been a kind of a recurring thing. If you absolutely need to have animation, um, yes, you can do silent MP4s, um, and they're much smaller. Um, don't do giant background animations and stuff like that. It just takes up too much, too much space, too much bandwidth. Second, use responsive images. Like these are good fundamental practices, right? Uh, use source set, use sizes to define all of the different image sizes that you might want to serve so the browser can make smart decisions about what it's going to deliver to the client. Um, there's a link at the bottom here, uh, which is an article by Eric Portis from Cloudinary, um, for how to, how to do this using the Cloudinary service. Lazy load images. This is something, this is a relatively new technology, uh, and Adi Asamani just uh, talked about this from the Chrome team. Um, and the idea here is that there's a loading property, uh, or a loading attribute, rather, and you can define how the browser should load images and iframes. So lazy basically has a, a whole algorithm behind it and that takes into account bandwidth, uh, network conditions, scroll position, and a bunch of other things to try and figure out when is the most opportune time to load this images in, image in so it doesn't block rendering, um, which is kind of cool. Same thing for, for iframes. Um, provide alternate formats. We just heard uh, before lunch about you know, all of these different formats, potential you know, for JPEG XR. Um, we can use the picture element to actually selectively deliver uh, better image uh, experiences to our users, smaller images to users. So in this case, I have a WebP image on top, uh, which would be served to any browser that understands the WebP mime, MIME type. But any browsers that don't support that or that don't support the picture element will fall back to the image inside of there. So again, always being smart and trying to deliver the smallest possible file uh, to our end users. That's just all kind of table stakes. Um, now we can, uh, oh, and I'll just mention really quickly, you can also use Cloudinary URLs, which will automatically, uh, also as was mentioned in the last talk, automatically decide what is the best format to, to provide for a, particular, um, for a particular image, and that's the F auto uh, property in there, or parameter in there. All right, so now I wanna tuck into some stuff that we can do with Service Worker. So fallback images are a really cool approach. So in this example, I'm going to show uh, how, you, how you do that. So uh, within the service worker, there are these various events, like I talked about, the install event being one of them. And in this case, I'm going to, uh, service workers are all based on promises. So just follow along with what I'm saying if none of that makes sense to you. But basically, you're waiting uh, for this event to return until the cache gets opened and until I have cached this offline.svg file. Okay, you would, you would probably pre-cache a lot more than this, but I'm simplifying the example. And the, the URL at the bottom is a link to my service worker source code on GitHub, which has the like, full version that I'm using on my site, which includes all of these approaches that I'm showing. So I've got that, I'm going ahead and on install, I'm caching that offline image. And then I've got a function within the, the service worker that will allow me to respond with that cached image. Okay, so if, if the catch, returning a catch match for the offline uh, SVG file. Then within the fetch event, and a fetch event is fired any time a resource is requested from the network, we attempt to fetch it. Fetch is kind of an upgraded version of Ajax, if, you're, if you remember that. Um, so basically, when the fetch occurs, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to see if this request is for an image. And then I am going to respond to that event with a fetch for the image. And so this will make a request out to the network. But if the network isn't available, I'm going to catch that event. This is all the promise stuff. So if that promise fails, then I can go ahead and respond with the fallback image. 
Okay. So what this ends up looking like is here I have a bunch of thumbnails of different people who have uh, made web mentions on my site. And if the network is not available, hey, these all just show up as my fallback image, which is kind of cool, right? All right. So save data is another thing that we don't often think about. And this is uh, something that's available in many uh, mobile browsers. Um, it's also starting to become available in desktop browsers as well. And what save data is, is an indication from the user that they want you to use as, as little data as possible uh, in delivering the experience. And so we can actually test for that. Uh, inside of the Navigator, we first test for the existence of uh, connection in Navigator. Let's see if I can get my... That's uh, not really showing up. All right. Uh, test for connection in Navigator, and then uh, if that exists, we can check for data, and then assign that to a variable, which we can then uh, reference later on. So inside of my fetch handler, inside of my image fetch, I could go ahead and say, hey, you know what? If I want to save data instead, I want to respond with a different fallback image. Okay, and um, here's the respond with fallback image where I'm, I'm supplying a, a URL to it. The uh, default is to, um, to test whether the URL is for an avatar, uh, which was the example I showed before, um, but otherwise it will fall back to a, a different fallback image. So what that ends up doing is doing something like this. So this is in another web mention. Um, I am not loading this external media because somebody has activated data saver. So instead, I'm going ahead and putting in a gray background with text that just says data saver active, media not loaded. And in this case, it's an SVG, and it's actually been accessibly marked up. So somebody will be able to, uh, who's non-sighted, will also know that that image um, was not loaded because they're saving data. Maybe we want to consider prioritizing some images, because sometimes we have images that are uh, native to our site, and sometimes we're bringing in some images from third parties as well. Um, and so we may want to make certain images high priority. So we could define those early on in our service worker, and then have a, a function that helps us to determine whether a particular image that's being requested is a high priority image or not. Um, and then we can, can make the determination of whether, whether to show it, whether to cache it, et cetera. And then the last thing that I want to go through in terms of these is um, actually managing our cache more smartly. So I mentioned that we can use the activate event to actually clean up our cache, like old caches that we have that might be stale, for instance. But even if you aren't upgrading, you may want to set limits to how many uh, of particular kinds of assets you want to have. So in this case, I have uh, kind of a, a dictionary of the different caches that I am managing, because a service worker can have multiple, uh, multiple ones. So in this case, I have a static cache, I have an image cache, I have a page cache, a post cache for blog posts, and a generic box for other. Okay. And in this case, I've highlighted the images cache because I've decided that I don't want to save more than 75 images in there. So I don't, I don't end up filling up somebody's cache totally you know, over the, the course of you know, maybe a couple of months of browsing to my site. Not that I have a ton of images on there, but it could happen. So by doing this and by setting you know, not only the cache name but setting a limit for it, I can then go back and clean up uh, those caches. So I have a function trim caches. This is based on, on work that Jeremy Keith did, um, where it actually goes through and it opens up the cache. And then once it has the cache, it gets the keys from the cache, which tell, so it's all a key value pair, basically, of, of what's stored. And then it's going to iterate through the items. And if there's more items than are allowed in the limit, it will go ahead and chop one off and then run the trim cache again. So it just kind of recursively calls itself um, until it gets below that, that threshold uh, that I've set of, in the case of images, 75 images. Now in order to actually activate that, um, I am going to use 
the, uh, I'm going to test, first of all, to see if my service worker uh, has a controller active, which is the if navigator.serviceworker.controller. And then I'm going to add a uh, load event to the web page, which then posts a message to that controller to tell it to tidy up or to clean up. So using post message to communicate across the two threads. So then on the recipient side within the service worker, I have an event listener that listens for a message to be sent across. And then if that message data is clean up, then it goes ahead and goes loops through all of the different caches that I have outlined in that dictionary, um, and then runs trim cache against each of them that has a limit defined. So again, trimming up what it is that's in there in order to release disk space. So putting them all together here, first of all, kind of table stakes. Let's not use animated GIFs, uh, especially as giant backgrounds. Use responsive images. It's really important. Your service worker can cache the most appropriate one that the browser determines it needs to load. Right? So that's pretty awesome for performance. Um, we should, should look to lazy load images. They can still be caught by the service worker when that network request goes out and still cached appropriately. Um, we want to provide alternate formats. Again, service worker is still going to provide a great enhancement on top of that. Um, we want to provide fallback images. So users at least get something if the network is interrupted. Maybe they go through a tunnel and they're on the train, or uh, their mobile network changes. They switch from mobile to Wi-Fi. I'm sure many of you have run into that before, where all of a sudden things just start breaking. Um, we should look to pay attention to things like the save data header. There's also the uh, various tests that you can do around what the network quality is as well. So you can see if something is um, a fast connection or a slow connection uh, or a metered connection and provide um, the most appropriate, most bandwidth friendly and user friendly experience for, for folks. Um, we want to prioritize certain images because not all images are equal in terms of their importance. And then finally, we want to make sure that we clean up after ourselves because honestly, the, this is such a privilege for us to be able to control what it is that we store on our users' devices, especially if the floodgates get open and we get unlimited storage as an installed PWA. That's huge. Like, let's not screw it up, right? It's incumbent on us not to mess it up. <clears throat> 